All right, the webinar is started. People will start trickling in now. We'll give it, we'll give it a few minutes before we start. And if you're joining us, why don't you put in the chat box where you're joining us from? Arizona, Oklahoma, Texas. A couple from North Carolina. Give another minute or two here. So it'll be me and Julie from the ODs on finance team <clears throat> here hosting and uh, helping out with Q&A and all, and all that. that. And Aaron, our fearless leaders are both on vacation slacking. So we're here picking up the slack. All right, maybe another few seconds. All right, well, let's start on time and people will continue trickling in. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this Sunday. I'm Chris Lopez with ODs on Finance, and we are very excited to welcome Steve Alexander here again for session two of this four-part series about uh, on getting on the path to predominantly private pay practice. If you haven't seen the first one, please go to the ODs on Finance YouTube channel to hear part one of Where Are We Now? Today's is going to be where are we headed? And uh, we have a couple sponsors here we're excited to hear from too. <clears throat> a couple of announcements before we start. It's been a couple of years in the works, but uh, we're very excited to announce our uh, career platform through ODs on Finance. It's ODs on Finance Careers. Really uh, inexpensive to host a job listing only $19 a month and selling your practice, only $299 per month, no brokerage fees, uh, a lot of growth so far and connecting practice sellers with potential practice buyers. So we're really excited about that. It's free for job seekers to uh, create a profile. So we encourage you to do that. And don't forget, we have uh, the best student loan refinance deals around with Laurel Road and Splash Financial. Please check them both out and and uh, use our, our referral links there. Don't forget to sign up for parts three and four of Steve's talks in this four part series. And first, let's hear from Aaron Werner of Vision Source. Aaron, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And, uh, and uh, we're here, we're excited about what you have to say. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Aaron and Dad better watch out because uh, if you and Julie, uh, Keep rocking like you did on our pre-chat call they're going to be in trouble you two are taking over the um so aaron warner with with vision source i have a practice in san diego a, a multi-generation practice here um, and really excited for the opportunity to be back with you all again i put my contact information up that way if anybody has any questions concerns anything we can do to to help you know please uh, reach out 
So we want to uh, chat a little bit today in our brief time, and I, I love the topic where we're going. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. The uh, We talked last time about how Vision Source firmly believes that uh, financial freedom um, really is, is uh, best obtained through practice ownership, or at least that's one of the best vehicles to get there. And we dove into the, the difference between being an employee and being an owner over a 40-year career and how significantly different uh, that is. Uh, what I want to chat just briefly a bit today is the, the current environment we find ourselves in. Next slide. So it's no surprise that inflation's here. Uh, we could argue whether recession's here or not. Um, but what, what does this mean to a practice and what does this mean to you, especially if you're a practice owner? You certainly feel it. Um, but we what we wanted to do here is, is really dive just a little bit deeper. So on the left, you can see a typical breakdown of the practice averages uh, percent of revenue for your cost of goods, your people costs, your place costs, your things costs. Um, OD compensation is typically about 15%. And then what left, what's left over is the, the profit for the practice and, and for the owner. Well, if we assign a, a, those percentages to a million dollar practice, you can see some dollars there. Uh, we chose a million because one, it makes the math easy and two, that's the average vision source practice. And then what we see is there's a nice healthy uh, compensation and profit at the, uh, at the bottom there. If we tag on just a little bit of inflation, certainly we're higher than this, but we just put in a nominal inflation of 5% for cost of goods and 3% for everything else. You can see the effect that that has on profit and cash flow to that $1 million practice, assuming no growth, right? Really what that is, is a almost a $28,000 loss in profit. So what does that mean? Next slide. If we're going to make up that 28,000, we got to really bring in 38,000 because there's some cost of goods in there. And if we say, hey, well, let's, uh, you know, how many more exams does that cost us? Is that going to take us? That's 100 more additional exams a year. Uh, if your practice is like mine, we're booked out. I don't know where I'm going to put uh, all those extra exams. And um, that feels like a lot more work for just getting the same amount of, of return. Um, so in, in the laws of, of getting more, we can, you know, see more exams, work harder. We can increase our average sale price, uh, raise our fees, and we can sell more to each patient. What we really want to do I think, is to address all three of these. So my question to all of you, and we certainly don't have time to dive into this, is, is what's your strategy? What, what is your strategy for your practice to uh, not only combat inflation, but take the opportunity to become more efficient? I know Steve's got lots of, uh, of good ideas and loved watching his last webinar, excited for what he's going to share today. But I just want to share with you what, uh, at a very high level, what Vision Source has for uh, vision source members, practice owners, just like yourselves. Um, and that's six key strategies. You can jump to the, the next slide. And there's a lot on these slides. I'm not going into them, but we've got a strategy on frame and lens, right? How do you save? How do you take advantage of programs? How do you have a good, efficient optical strategy in the practice? And we leverage programs that the vision source has like frame dream and optical dream and education and, and relationships with our vendors. We've also got next slide. Uh, next strategy is in the contact lens frame. You know, how do we engage with the, the vision source elite vendors, Alcon, Cooper Vision, and our select vendor, BNL, uh, to get the best pricing, to get the best profitability in the in the, the contact lens space? And how do we maintain contact with our patients so that we can continue to uh, generate revenue and help them get what they need? They don't have to go looking uh, at 1-800 or big box store when they start running out mid-year. Our next strategy is in the, the learning and development. We don't call it, you can go ahead, next slide. We don't call it education because education is what we all did in school for four years. And uh, we studied hard, we took tests, we passed them. Learning and development is a journey. And so how do you uh, have protocols, clinical protocols to make sure that you're taking care of all your medical patients? How do you have protocols that help get you away from uh, just focusing on the revenue from your optical, but other profit centers like AMD, myopia management, uh, vision therapy, whatnot, all right? How do you continue learning with your, with your teams and with your staff? Oh. No, you're good. We can keep going. Um, how do you market your practice? Right? What are some marketing strategies? I am not a marketing person. And so if I didn't have a resource like Vision Source to, to help develop marketing strategies, I'd be, uh, I'd be out of luck. I hate social media. I don't like marketing things. So I need that support. And, uh, and, and how are you leveraging that in your practice to educate your patients on what you're doing and, uh, and recruit new patients and stay in touch with your, your current patients? We've also got a managed care strategy. That's a lot of why you are all in here. And, uh, and you know, hopefully we can all get more private pay patients. And, uh, and Steve certainly has some fantastic uh, advice and insights on that. 
Um, but sometimes managed care is still part of the game we get to play. So are you taking advantage of, of what you can do within that realm? Are you making sure that you're collecting your copays properly, that you're billing properly, that you're dotting all your I's and crossing your T's to make sure that the managed care game, you understand the rules. So you're playing the game and not just subject to it. We've got the practice life cycle strategy, and that's the uh, the one we talked a little bit about last time, and uh, and I'll finish with uh, this time. And that's everything from students to you're getting ready to retire and uh, install your practice and transition out. So what are you doing within that that practice life cycle? And do you have resources and contacts to to help you? Um, are you looking for associates? Are you connecting with students so that when uh, you do need an associate? Uh, you've got students ready to to come and work for you, uh, which is very different between urban and rural practices, as we know. Um, are you an associate looking to become an owner? Are you an owner looking to grow and expand? Um, and then what is your slow exit strategy so that you can take full advantage of what you, you've built? Um, and all, through all six of these strategies, we're, we're really proud at Vision Source, the next slide, um, to say that they work. And uh, we can see over time that Vision Source practice year over year growth uh, very much outpaces uh, the industry average. And so uh, so I'll finish on the, the next fund. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, again, I want to invite anybody to our upcoming uh, course that's happening in just a couple of weeks, actually about uh, 10 days. Um, but we're really looking at practice transitions and acquisitions and expansion. So how do you uh, know what you need to do in this current environment and how can we help? And in that, we have two different programs. On um, the next slide, one is a, a stimulus rebate program and this is the most common one where we can help you with uh, with that that interest you're going to pay on the uh, on your note through Vision Source, right? And uh, the other is a, is a capital funding, and this is it comes into play when sometimes the the valuations that we're working with are a little bit higher than what uh, the bank will loan, and, and there's a there's a gap there, and Vision Source can step in and help uh, fund that gap. So we're really excited to to invite you all to this course. We've got Dr. Mick Kling, who I know has speak, spoken to this group before, uh, along with Ali Aramchian, who uh, engages with ODIs on, on finance. He's from HR for Health and DM Council. And Dale, Dale Fisher, who is the Business Development Officer at Bank of America. Um, we'll put the link up, but uh, if you're interested at all in, in buying your first, second, hundredth practice, what this looks like in today's market, would love to invite you to the course. You just have to uh, pay for your, your way out there, but the course registration and uh, is free. Uh, for all of you. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what we've got uh, from Steve and the rest of the webinar. Thank you, guys. Aaron, thanks a lot for uh, uh, for that. It's really wonderful to hear about all the resources you and, and Vision Source have to offer. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. And next, we'll hear from our, our other sponsor, Optify. And you'll hear from, uh, from Dave Barton on that. Dave, you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks. Yeah, I'll um, share my screen right here. Should be able to see that popping up right now. So yeah, thank you. So my, my name is Dave Barton. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO of Optify. Uh, we have Jen on the call too, who um, uh, should be able to answer questions. Uh, if you're interested in this product after we go through it, um, please uh, book a demo uh, to learn more. Uh, we have some special incentives going with ODs and Finance. We've worked with ODs and Finance for a while now. Um, we love working with them. Dat and Aaron are awesome. Julia is amazing. She's a customer. Um, I've personally worked with uh, Anagram over the years, a uh, great product. So it's great to see Steve. I know Jeremy and, uh, and Jenna and the crew over there. They have that great new product, Prosper, um, that we love too. So what is Optify? We are the industry's number one uh, omni-channel and e-commerce solution. We basically get your optical up online. What is omni-channel? I mean, I think people are looking at this, but um, uh, here's an example of a successful omni-channel rollout. That was Best Buy. Um, they connected digital and physical successfully and are uh, are succeeding. Uh, an unsuccessful rollout um, would have been like Circuit City. They uh, they essentially became a showroom for Amazon, and uh, that didn't work out. I'm sure there are a lot of other like you know things that were going on there too. But this is kind of a high level like what works, what doesn't with Omnichannel. So if your website sends patients away, you're essentially in a lot of ways, showrooming for um, big brands, kind of like Circuit City did. So what you want to do is connect your patients' uh, eventual purchase with the products that you sell. You have the world's largest brands. You have the world's most sought after brands. Uh, if a patient, you get them to your website, you want to keep them there and you want to show them your products, just like, uh, just like Best Buy does. 
44% of private practice patients research eyewear before they come in for an exam or after they've left. This is the Vision Council Internet Influence Report. So when you're in your exam chair or you're in the optical seeing patients come through, um, you should know that about half of them have already been on somebody else's website, uh, if they haven't been on yours, to uh, research eyewear. So you may eventually convert them to a sale, but you're just making it harder on yourselves. There's a lot, ways, a lot of ways to make it easier. Your website should make it easier for your patients to buy their glasses from you, to buy more of them from you, and to buy them faster from you. you know, basically, that's what Omnichannel is. That's what uh, the digital connection that we help you make does. So you would put a uh, link on your main website uh, to browse eyewear like this site did, which takes you to the Optify powered part of the, uh, the patient experience, lives on your subdomain, you get the search benefit. You can put any brand you want um, that you have access to on your site. Um, and the patients have a rich browsing and shopping experience they can buy, they can virtually try on, uh, they can request products to try on in your practice. Uh, it's a seamless integration with the patient experience, just makes everything easier. It also makes it easier on your staff because now they can see the frames the patient wants to try on when they come in. So as an optician, uh, this is probably a multi-pair sale. You have sunglasses and opticals, a fashion for a customer. They're looking for a premium product. This is optician gold. Uh, it makes the handoff from the um, doctor to the optician a lot easier too. So just getting in the patient's mind, connecting the purchase to the practice makes life a lot better for everyone. Uh, you don't have to take pictures of product and you don't have to send marketing out uh, to the patients. These are things that we hear a lot, super time consuming. Um, we have a catalog of over 300,000 brands, uh, 300,000 images, 750 brands, and we have marketing automations. We connect with Revolution and Crystal and CompuLink and Affinity, OfficeMate, Soon Uprise and iCloud Pro to um, get your product up online. So you don't have to take those pictures, sync your inventory every day, and then automatically send marketing to your patients. Um, big brands, big companies that spent millions of dollars, millions of dollars, they're doing this for a reason because they're trying to sell a product. This is a consumer product, a fashion item. Um, we've provided this type of best-in-class optical experience for your patients at a very affordable price for private practice. It's 40% or more of most private practice revenue. Uh, you are retailers as much as we are service providers. So you want to invest in that patient experience and make it just easier uh, and a more lucrative experience for your practice. Less than 3% of your annual wholesale frame revenue spend, Optify costs. We have a proven 10 times ROI uh, of your investment of, of the service and we save staff, staff time and it's very simple to implement. So uh, it's time to be online and uh, thank you for your time. Please book a demo. We have great incentives for the ODs on finance uh, group. Thank you. Awesome, Dave, thanks for, thanks for that too. I will share my screen now. And... All right, Julie, do you wanna make this quick announcement? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, thanks so much, Dave and Jen. Um, I'm a very happy Optify customer. So if you're interested, definitely click on that link to get a demo. So if you all um, have heard or not, we've actually are having a um, um, ODs on finance group buy for the A scan if you're treating myopia, managing myopia. The price is phenomenal. It's less than $4,000. Um, myself and Aaron both have it and it's very accurate, very easy to use. We've used it on many kids. You numb the eye and it gives a very, very quick reading. So it's very portable. The price is list price is $3,995 plus shipping, but the ODs on finance special is a lot better at $3,295. You get free shipping, three-year warranty. And if you don't live in the state of California, Florida, or Pennsylvania, then you don't get tax on it. So if you're interested in the A-Scan deal, it does end at the end of this month on the 30th. Um, go ahead and send an email to Rafael Ramirez. His email address is on that um, um, slide. And if you want more information, go ahead and um, visit the website at dghtechnology.com. If you have any questions regarding the use of it, um, you can PM myself or Aaron or um, Raphael. We can go over our experience within the last couple of weeks. Thank you. So today's uh, event will we'll start now. This is a non-CE event and all materials property of the speaker and not ODs on finance. All views and opinions expressed by the speaker and not of ODs on finance. Really happy to introduce Steve Alexander. Steve's been in the eye industry for a, uh, a long time, all of his adult life and then some. Started as an optician at age 16 and has worked as a tech, lab tech, practice manager, regional manager, consultant, has won, uh, worn a bunch of other hats. 
in the industry. Over the last eight years, Steve has been consulting with practices to find ways to better understand the patients, the ecosystems in which they work, and how to create a practice of which they can be proud of. For the last two years, Steve has had uh, held a position as head of marketing and partnerships at, Ant at Anagram, an industry-leading tech platform driving change in eye care with the explicit focus of- Chris, sorry care. to interrupt. It seems like it's very hard to hear you. It's hard to hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you, uh, but it is quite low, and a, a bunch of chat is saying that it's it's very hard to hear you. Oh, uh, sorry about that. I, I can try to speak up. Steve, how about instead of me talking, because it's hard to hear me, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, chat, can you hear me okay? Give me a quick thumbs up. We can hear you great, Steve. Okay, awesome. So I will, uh, sorry about that, Chris. I'll take over screen share, and I'll do, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, the unfortunate truth is Zoom is not a perfect science. Uh, it's kind of, we're, we're getting there, we're doing our best, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity. Um, my name is Steve Alexander. I am head of marketing and partnerships at Anagram. Uh, this is session two of um, this uh, four-part series that I'm very excited about of uh, getting practices um, to continue down the path of uh, predominantly private pay practice. So today we're going to cover some uh, pretty major topics. Uh, we're going to do some intro. Or I'm going to introduce myself and, and do a bit of recap of what we did last time. We're going to talk about where we're headed. We're going to talk about going to market. Uh, we're going to talk very, very briefly about results and follow-up and iteration. And then we're going to talk about the most important step, which we learned last time is the next step. Um, so to get started, um, introductions and recap. Um, so my name is Steve Alexander. Again, um, I've been in the industry forever. I love eye care. I so relish the opportunity to speak to practitioners and practice managers and industry folks about what we can do to make things better for our patients, to make things better for our constituents, to make things better for uh, the practices themselves and the practice owners, something that uh, is often sort of left by the wayside is a financially struggling practice can't reinvest and can't improve its patient care. Uh, I think Dr. Werner did a great job presenting, you know, what a partnership uh, or a series of partnerships can do for a practice in terms of uh, the growth that you can experience or the support that you need. Um, I think Dave also did a great job talking about what um, meeting the patients where they are can do for your practice. Anytime a, an organization can say that they're going to give you a 10x ROI, that's something that should make you pause and take notice. Um, so uh, now I'm going to dive in a little bit to what we talked about last time to kind of get everyone back into the mode of where we were. So we nailed um, two pillars of conversation that I sort of identified as an external pillar and an internal one, things that are either within our control or not, and um, the things that we can do with each of them. Um, what I wanted to do as part of the building your private pay practice um, is to control what you can control. So think about where the growth happens. Think about implementing the tools and the tech and the processes um, through specialties or staff and development, things that are um, big concepts. And I know it's easy to sort of glaze over when it's such a big concept. And we're going to dive in a little bit deeper this time around. Um, we want to work on finding your private pay people, um, and something that you'll hear me say repeatedly is that this is difficult. Nothing that I'm suggesting is a silver bullet. Nothing that you know you'll hear me say, and then suddenly everything will be easy. That is, uh, yeah. As much as I wish I had that kind of superpower, that is not a feasible uh, thing for us to do. But uh, recognize what you want to accomplish. Identify what kind of practice you want to build, and then set steps to actually build it. Um, and that's where the thrust of today's conversation is going to be: is in setting those steps. Um, and then one kind of final note here is: you're independent. You're not alone. There are groups, there are consultants, there are partners, there are people in the industry who are invested in your success. Um, now you've got to go find them, you've got to find the ones that align with what you're trying to do and that genuinely work with you and work 
for you uh, to make you more successful, but they are out there. Odie's on Finance is a wonderful example of a group that gathers all of these things together. They are a group of ODs that are out to help each other out. Uh, they gather other industry experts, they gather partners, um, they gather sponsors, they host these kinds of events. They, you know, it, it's one of those things where you look at and it's like an oasis to replenish yourself and your ideas in kind of a, a desert of ideas in uh, eye care for a long time. So um, last time I, I uh, left myself a note to be grateful. And this time I, I want to open with gratitude. I think it's so important to recognize the good that is being done. And, um, you know, thank you, Chris and Julie. Thank you, Dat and Aaron. Uh, thank you to Optify and Vision Source for the sponsorship. I think this is a, a tremendous partnership that goes into a bunch of different directions and uh, can't overstate the value of all of that. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to have slides up like this with some quotes, with some time uh, to open up for questions. So if there are questions that you guys have, feel free to drop them in the chat, and then Chris will um, ask them when one of these slides pops up. Yeah, no questions so far, Steve. But... Okay, great. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to take a quick sip of water, and then uh, we're going to dive in a little bit further. Actually, one thing for the chat, there are, I think, five quotes scattered throughout this presentation. Um, let me know your favorite one when you see it, or let me know, give me a quick thumbs up when you like a quote. It'd be useful for me when I source other ones. Um, last time around, I sourced one from Brandon Sanderson, my favorite fantasy author. This is from Douglas Adams, my favorite science fiction author. Um, okay. So now we're going to get into where are we headed. Now, uh, recognize that this is a massive topic, and it is impossible to cover this uh, in uh, cover this exhaustively in an hour. But uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of points. So uh, we have more options than they want us to think. I think the industry has done a really great job of hammering home a couple of very consistent messages over the 20 years or so that I've been in the space. And some of those messages are around filling the chair, you know, take every plan, fill the chair as much as you can. Some of those are around independence. Um, there, there's messaging around staying independent and not working too hard with too closely with your colleagues. And then what ends up happening is the folks that do work together or bundle together end up getting ahead. And it uh, is it builds this kind of cycle of sort of being alone as opposed to independent. So um, we want to think about what we can do, again, with the overarching theme of controlling what it is we can control. So last time we saw uh, those external versus internal set in these kind of uh, concentric circles where the central circle is something that you have more control over and the outside circle are forces that you have to sort of contend with. So the question that I want to ask as we discuss where we're headed is where are they headed? If you think about what we're looking at here, uh, private equity and vision plans and uh, e competitive e-commerce and competitive brick and mortar, vertical integration and consolidation, um, there are only a couple of likely outcomes. You know, there's no reason to assume that any of these are going to stop doing what they're already doing. There's no reason to think that they wouldn't continue the consolidation because it has worked. You know, over the uh, weekend, um, Shamir was re was acquired fully, um, and that was something that was pending for a while. And, and you know, it is part of a ongoing series of acquisitions that are happening. And, and look, there's probably some good that will come from that full acquisition in terms of lens availability and delivery, but it would be, um, I would be remiss not to mention that those things are continuing and accelerating and uh, we have to be aware of it. So if you think about, as we think about where they're headed, uh, there's a couple of really great models to look at to see what has happened in the history of healthcare uh, in the States. I pulled a quick bit of information from the pharmacy industry. And, you know, if you look at how things shake out there, um, about 60,000 retail pharmacies in the U.S., um, one third are independent pharmacies. So there's still 20,000 mom and pop, more or less, pharmacies in the States. Now, that's not something that 
I really think about. Uh, usually when I'm, you know, when I'm in town, I go to a local pharmacy because I'm familiar with my neighborhood. But when I travel, all I see are Walgreens and CVS and Rite Aid and so forth. And I, I feel like that is a likely outcome of the eye care industry as it is moving where the big boxes will consolidate and close competitors and you know, find the best place in each town to uh, build a spot and sort of stake their uh, claim in the ground. But what you can see is that um, there's still a significant number of independent pharmacies that exist. And as you dive deeper into this, um, there are plenty of successful independent pharmacies and they are successful by virtue of doing things that the big boxes or the um, chains or the um, supermarkets don't and more or less can't do. So in, in the pharmacy world, you know, there are the prescription uh, medications that patients go to pick up once they're prescribed. And a lot of pharmacies just count the medication and uh, make sure that the patient doesn't have uh, counterindications for the, the actual medication and keep that safe. Um, but there are those mom and pop shops that do compounding in store for medication that a farm, uh, Walgreens can't do or doesn't have the time to do. And they carve out a pretty successful specialty pharmacy business. Now, obviously, there's not a one to one correlation between pharmacy and eye care, but it is something that we can think about. Uh, another note with pharmacy is that, you know, CVS tried to get into the eye care game, uh, tried for six, seven years. And uh, I think a couple of months ago announced that they're closing all of their optical shops. They're going to stay an online retailer to some degree, uh, but no more opticals in within CVS stores. Um, so there is still that element of uh, privacy and there's still that element of local. And I think uh, among customers, especially, um, you know, these coming generations, local is much more interesting and uh, much more where patients would rather go than big boxes. So we're going to keep this in mind as we talk through it. And then we come to kind of the big question. Uh, where are we headed? If we agree that these are the things that we can control, and these are the things that we have uh, an immediate grasp over, where can we go? And the truth is, wherever we decide to go. And this is something that I think probably sounds awfully optimistic and awfully pie in the sky, but um, if we set ourselves up for success, then we can build whatever business we want. The demand is still clearly there. And uh, one of the reasons that I love the industry the way that I do is because of the passion and talent that we have at every facet of the industry. Um, as the introductions were happening for this presentation today, you know, I looked through the participants in the chat and there are a bunch of incredibly talented doctors that are present. And, and I'm so flattered that they would spend their Sunday morning listening to me talk. Uh, and there are so many consultants and industry folks that are in the chat that are there to help make this side of our business successful. So while, you know, it is a, a little bit cliche to say we're headed wherever we decide to go. I think it is something that if we internalize that it is really up to us where we go, then um, we can actually make it a reality. And, um, you know, I would love to hear stories in the chat about things that that echo this. Um, thank you, Dr. Culpepper, for, for weighing in. I, I totally agree. Um, so, if uh, we understand that uh, where we're headed is wherever we decide to go, then uh, we start to have to answer some other questions, some of the specifics of the how and why and when and what. Uh, and the what, I think, is going to be very specific to each individual practice, um, and it's going to be very specific to this. So at the end of session one, I asked everyone to start thinking about stuff, and I didn't really assign homework because I know everyone's got uh, a billion things going on, and, and homework isn't something that you want, especially on a Sunday, or at least that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, but we had uh, set out some expectations that you're going to think about setting up an action plan. You're going to analyze the things that you sort of instinctively know about your practice to start thinking about, okay, well, what is it that I do want to do? 
everyone on this call probably wants to make some kind of change to how they practice. And um, given the title and, and the topic, it, it's on, around building more private paid business. Now, uh, because I work for Anagram, because I do a lot of out of network consulting, um, a lot of the conversation here um, is interested in seeing like, well, when do I know how I drop a vision plan? So I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation doing um, two things. We're going to hang on. Sorry, I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation doing two things. I'm going to go over a go-to-market plan. Um, I'm first. I'm going to go over how to build a go-to-market plan, and then second, I'm going to go over how a out-of-network go-to-market plan might look. So um, it's going to go from general to specific, and then um, I will invite questions throughout the process. At the conclusion of the presentation, um, when the recording is ready, I'm going to ask the ODs on Finance crew to send out a couple of things. Uh, one is going to be a scripting guideline for how to have how to train your staff to speak on the out of network conversation, how to answer those out of network questions. And one of those items will be a direct script that is more or less a transcription of how I presented it last time. Um, then I'm going to send an infographic that would teach you how to think about uh, having the out of network conversation, because for some folks, a script is really useful. And for others, a script is really not useful. I'm one of the latter folks. I don't like being told what to say, but I do like understanding why I should be saying a thing. So um, we're going to send a full script and an infographic that lays out the guideline. The other thing that we're going to send is going to be much of these slides uh, that are laid out as kind of individual um, items. Uh, they're going to be put together as a document for you to then look at a go to market plan and then build your own go to market plan. So um, at the conclusion of this, you're going to get a ton of resources. Um, well, hopefully they're useful to you. Um, I would also love to hear from the chat um, other resources that you think would be beneficial to you. Uh, and I ask this because uh, I'm really passionate about building this in a way that is useful to you. It's easy for me to talk about this because I've been doing it for 20 years, but um, I want to see change happen. So please, 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 if there's a thing that you want on, on vision plans, on having conversations, on training your staff, hit me up with it. Throw it in the chat, throw it to Odie's on finance. Uh, and you guys in, in attendance should know, everyone on the Odie's on finance team is, is working their butts off to give you utility, to give you things you can act on. And uh, I couldn't be prouder to be working with this crew. Questions. We're equally as proud, Steve. I appreciate that. <laughs> there are some questions, but I think you're going to hit on them uh, in a little bit. So I think we'll hold off on them. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to stay hydrated while we do this. Sounds good. And you're getting some love in the chat. Everyone's uh, really excited to see those uh, resources that you're going to provide afterwards. Awesome. 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 Okay, here we go. So today's uh, the thrust of today's agenda is going to market. If we've decided to make a change, then let's assume that everyone on this call has, how do we execute? Now, uh, this is a uh, layout of how to create a go-to-market plan. Now, uh, the reason I put this together the way that I did is because this is something that I think plagues eye care in uh, an insidious and sort of subtle way. I touched on it a little bit in the last session. Uh, let's say an OD or a practice owner goes to an expo and they buy a piece of equipment. They're excited about the piece of equipment. They think it's going to make a huge impact on their practice. They have a use case for their patient base. And then they bring it up. Um, they bring it up in a way that uh, says like, I'm excited about this. Let's do it. And then that's sort of it. And they expect the staff to kind of figure it out. And then whatever piece of equipment they have, whatever uh, change they wanted to make sort of falls by the wayside because the infrastructure to have this conversation, to make it successful, to enforce and reinforce the why of what we're doing um, doesn't happen. And then that piece of equipment that you bought or that process change that you wanted to make or the new software that you brought in, it doesn't work because your team doesn't adopt it. 
And um, part of it happens because everyone's really busy and there's a lot to focus on and every, people are putting out fires all the time. Um, but as you make a change, any change, you want to think about all of these topics here. So um, part of my goal in building this was to make it so that it is applicable to whatever you want to change in your practice. And then part of my goal was to get a, uh, a vision plan, uh, go to market plan written out so that it is shareable so that you can see how it how it goes. Um, so we're going to start with um, the objective hypothesis and internal description. Uh, objective should be easy enough. What do we want to do? In this case, when we get to the more detailed one, it'll be uh, going out of network. But for those of you that thought about your action plan, um, let's nail down what it is you want to accomplish. Then there's your hypothesis. Um, and I did write it, you know, do like an if then statement. So if I do X, then Y is likely to happen. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, you guys who went to uh, school, took a chemistry class, you guys will know that um, you guys will know that that an if then statement is what you used to do on your lab reports, right? So it, exactly like that. What do you expect to happen? Now, don't expect to be right. It's a hypothesis. You could have misread your audience, but at least you will know what you expect, and then you can build everything else on top of that. Next up is your internal description, uh, and that is how you describe what you're doing to your team. Now, uh, at the top is think about your team and all of the stakeholders that need to be informed of the change. So what does that mean? Who are the stakeholders in a change? Um, and it depends on what you're doing, but if you think about your practice in terms of the departments that likely exist, so there's the front desk, there's the tech team, there's the exam lane, uh, whether that's an OD and a scribe, just an OD or you know more than an OD, depending on, on what it is your practice does. Um, or in the case of some practices, a front desk no longer exists, but the, uh, the way that you uh, greet customers or the, the first touch point, whoever is going to be your first point of contact in the practice. Um, then you think about your optical department, you think about your back office, there are implications in what you're changing to um, every department, and you want to make sure that every department is aware of the change that you want to make and the likely impact on them, and get their feedback, they know their department probably much better than you do. So let them tell you what changes need to happen for them to succeed. That way they have ownership of and participation in the change, as opposed to saying this has to happen right now, figure it out. That is a great way to get somebody to become defensive. Now, uh, I say defensive deliberately because uh, that is something you hear about or is something I hear about all the time. As a consultant, um, when you, I tell a practice owner or manager, you know, here's kind of what I see as the problem, and here are some ways you can address that issue. Uh, one of the most prevailing problems that they run into about making the actual change is staff resistance. Now, it's often described as resistance to change, which certainly is true. People are generally resistant to change, especially if they have to learn something new or change what they've been doing for a long time. Um, but there's also a better way to present it. And usually one of the better ways to present it is to get them on board through ownership, get, you, leveraging their expertise to make, what, to make the change that you wanna make a positive one for them and a positive one for their coworkers and a positive one for their patients. Next. Um, the external description is very similar to the internal one, except it's how you're going to talk about the change that you made to the people outside of your organization. So your patients, your customers, your partners, your uh, marketing team, whatever, whoever is not actually going to be making the practical change, you have to understand how to communicate the change in a positive light. So if you're going to be going out of network, um, there is a there are better and worse ways to start those conversations. Um, communication. Then once you figured out what your description is, then you're going to figure out how to actually communicate it. And those are separate for a reason. First, you think about what it is you're doing and then think about how you're going to bring it out. Next is the target, target market. Who's going to be affected by it? 
Is it your entire patient base? Is it a select amount of your patient base? Is it a patient base that you haven't built yet, but really want to see? Um, who is your target? And once you're looking at who is your target, how big is it? How much impact could they have, positive or negative, depending on what you're doing? And make your decisions accordingly. Understand who you're trying to talk to. Understand who you're trying to appeal to. Meet your customers where they are. Um, and that is a, a really important lesson, I think, to take away here. Then there's your time period. We're doing something that has a cost. Even if you're not paying for a new thing, even if you're trying to execute a thing you bought a long time ago, there is a cost that comes with change. Training costs money, making mistakes costs money, marketing costs money, and money is a stand-in for time here. Anytime you try to make a change, it costs money and time and effort and energy. Um, so you don't want it to go on forever. You don't want it to sort of, you don't want easy mistakes to linger for a long time. You don't want um, to not create accountability. You want accountability around the time period, around the communication, around execution. And then um, you want to develop your success criteria. So I've figured out all of this other stuff I know what I want to do. My staff knows what they want to do. They seem to be bought in. We're ready to go. So what does a successful launch look like? And that means when I kick it off, when we get this started, how do I know that we've given all of the tools that are necessary or as much of the tools that are as are necessary to not uh, make it a problem for us, to, to know that we're on the right track? How do you measure that initial success? And then how do you measure that success in a month? or three months, or a year. And each of those things are different. Uh, initial success is very, very different than success a year from now, because the, the initial success is just that you're doing it, usually, right? Is that just that your staff is having the conversation, that your patients are doing a thing, um, that you see that there is uptake. It's just getting the ball rolling. You know, it's starting that momentum, going from nothing to something or going from a lot of something to nothing, but you're changing the direction and that is challenging. After the success criteria is established, then you set up your kickoff. Now kickoff is the um, sort of last meeting that you have from to, to delineate between the time before you were doing this thing to the time after. So if you do a kickoff, let's say on a Monday, that Saturday that you were open or the Friday that you were open the week before is the last day of business before this change has been implemented. Now, you know, bear in mind, this isn't something for small changes. If you bring in a new frame collections, all of this work is probably not necessary. Um, but if you bring in a new ordering software or if you bring in a new um, uh, edger, Right. If you bring in a new machine, anything that will likely change how the how a lot of work flows deserves this kind of go to market strategy. Um, and then something that I will always emphasize, thank everyone for the work that they've done and celebrate getting this far. Again, none of this is easy. None of this is simple. This takes time and effort and a lot of brain lift. And uh, creating out something out of nothing is so challenging and exhausting and it's surrounding an already challenging and exhausting role. It's very difficult to uh, devote the time, but it is, I think, necessary. Steve, great stuff. We do have some questions. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so someone commented, some vision plans are not giving out of network benefits. How would you address this conversation with the patient? If uh, the practice, if the patient doesn't have out of network benefits at all, uh, it would be about telling them why they should see you, why your practice and why now. So if they've called your practice, they're talking to you. And if they're a new patient, you want to make a case to tell them that, your practice has, uh, you know, these kinds of services and these kinds of products. And here is what we want to accomplish for you. Here is why you should come see us or here's why you should come see our doctor. And a lot of that should come from building a practice culture. 
if your practice understands why your patient should come see you, um, if your practice understands why your practice, sorry, if your staff understands why your practice exists the way that it does, they should be able to convey that information to your patients. Now, you're not going to win 100% of the time, but it is a conversation that your patients should be able to have. If we took uh, vision plans out of the conversation altogether, and change the conversation to be like a uh, patient is calling your practice to you know find out whether they should come see you or your competitor uh, five or six blocks away or a mile away whatever um, how would you answer those questions how it, you know all other things being equal why should your patient come see you now if it's you know strictly that they want to use their benefits and, and believe me there are patients who do want that there's no convincing them that if they don't have any kind of benefit that they might come see you, you know, those you might have to chalk up as a loss. Uh, but I would also encourage you to think about it that patients who chase their vision plans, patients who chase the lowest possible price are likely not your customer. Unless you have built a practice around low cost and volume and churning through patients, you don't really want to work with patients who only want the lowest possible price, and you don't really want to work with patients who only want what their vision plan is uh, going to allow. Not because they don't deserve the treatment, but because it's likely counter to the business that you want to build and likely counter to the level of quality and the level of service that you want to provide. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> we'll do one more question. And so, Steve, it sounds like a lot of what you're discussing comes back to, to communication. How can a practice owner best go about discussing the decision to drop a vision plan with their staff, which actually also sounds like a good idea for a resource? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll I'll take that into uh, advisement. But um, ultimately, it's about understanding why you're dropping it. Right. So if you are dropping a low reimbursing vision plan and um, you are doing it because you think it'll a lot like actually it goes back to the go to market. It goes back to your hypothesis. If I drop X low reimbursing vision plan, then I expect I will see Y fewer patients, which will and uh, keep my revenue the same or see my revenue grow then you can say to your practice, I'm dropping this vision plan because it makes us do a lot more work for a lot less money for patients that are not really satisfied with the work that we're able to do because of what we have to do with this vision plan. So what I expect to happen is when we drop it, some will stay and some will go. The ones that stay will make more revenue for us and will keep their prices as reasonable as we can. And the ones that stay, we will get to treat them the way we think they deserve to be treated instead of the way the vision plans say they have to be treated. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think we're good on questions, so you can uh, keep going. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Your audio has been fixed, by the way. Okay. So um, here is the going out of network, go to market sample. Now I did still keep it um, generic. I didn't want to harp on a particular vision plan, but XYZ vision plan can stand in for whatever vision plan you are thinking about dropping and, you know, or however many multiples of vision plans you're thinking about dropping. So our objective is to drop this vision plan while causing minimal disruption to practice operation and KPIs. Uh, while retaining as many vision plan patients as out of network customers. Uh, KPIs are key performance indicators or metrics. So you want to do this while keeping the things that you're already tracking it, where they need to be, if not improving them. Basically, the objective is to drop this without causing problems. Um, hypothesis, right? If my practice drops XYZ vision plan, then we will have more time to devote to the rest of our patients with minimal or no negative impact on practice net revenue. Uh, those of you that listen to the 2020 Money podcast will have heard in the last month, uh, there was a uh, Dr. King uh, who talked about dropping his last vision plan. He mentioned that um, when he did that, his patient volume decreased by 25%, but his practice revenue stayed the same. So think about all of the implications of dropping your patient volume by a quarter and your revenue staying the same. That means that every single person on your team has 25% fewer things to do and your revenue is the same. 
I, I know I said the same thing repeatedly, but I think it's it's worth hammering the idea. Um, okay, internal description. We're terminating our contractual relationship with XYZ Vision Plan in the next few months. Um, XYZ Vision Plan represents about 10% of our 10% of our patients every month, and here's the impact we expect initially. Uh, patients who don't have that vision plan will be unaffected, and our process for those patients will be unchanged. I think it's important as we're doing this to recognize like this is the uh, group of people that are going to be impacted. Everyone else you treat exactly as before. So it really laser focuses the change in the process to the uh, target market that we talked about earlier in the outset. Um, for XYZ vision plan patients, we're going to help them file their vision benefits as an open access provider. Uh, we will provide training, education, and resources for everyone on the team, so we're all prepared to have these conversations with our patients and customers. Uh, those latter two points, really important in emphasizing what we're doing, right, and how we're going to do it. A lot of this stuff, um, trying to make change, falls because we don't set appropriate expectations, because we don't provide enough in terms of training, because we don't devote enough effort on the front end to make it successful. As we put more effort in at the front, it'll be a smoother kickoff. If we sort of, uh, if we don't do as well up front, the likelihood is that your uh, first rejection or your first couple of rejections to the process will stick in your cut in your patients. I'm sorry, yeah, actually in your patients and your staff's minds, and they will become less inclined to continue. Uh, but if we put in the work up front, we can reinforce that it is a necessary change and it is not an optional one. External description. Now, I'm not going to read through all of this, but uh, everyone, if, you, if you're looking at the presentation and want to take a screenshot, by all means, uh, this will be included in that document that I mentioned earlier, so you don't have to hurry about it. But in, in essence, we want to understand um, how we're going to describe our change to our customers in positive, engaging, celebratory terms. Because in truth, uh, any change that you're making to your practice should be a win-win uh, change. And if it's not, you know, maybe that's something that you ought to think about in how you communicate it. You know, there's uh, there are circumstances that are, aren't always positive when, you know, staff leaves or uh, an OD uh, you know, retires or whatever, like it, it, you can celebrate uh, and that's going to change your practice operations, but the, you can't be as um, positive about the impact it's going to have necessarily. So obviously keep that in mind, but um, when you're making a change that you think your patients are going to react negatively to it, treat them sort of like toddlers. You know, if, if a toddler skins their knee, and you start getting worried about them and you're terrified and they can tell, they start crying louder. Um, but if you're calm and you tell them that they're okay and it's gonna be fine and just to keep playing, odds are it's just gonna be fine and they're gonna keep playing. So I, I don't want the takeaway from this presentation to be treat your patients like toddlers, but you know, if the, if the tiny little shoe fits, so to speak. Um, and then there's communication, target market, and time period. So we talked about uh, the communication. That is going to be a direct result of uh, your external description. You know what you're going to say. You know how you want to say it. Now it's up to you and your team to then put it into those various venues. So using the tools that you have at your disposal, which are many and varied, you know, between your EHR and your patient communication platform and social media and your website and your staff and any community events that you go to, you've got a lot of opportunities to share this message and you've got a lot of opportunities to hopefully make it a positive one. With your target market, hopefully your, the data in your EHR, your PMS is solid enough where you can start to have this conversation fairly directly. Um, you know, if not, you're going to want to do your best. Um, something that you can use for vision plan stuff is odds are you know the biggest employers in your neighborhood that provide that vision plan. So if you're dropping one and you know that, you know, everyone who has that vision plan works for Home Depot or whatever, um, you want to have that conversation with Home Depot, potentially. That's not a great example because they hate it when you do that and no one ever works there somehow. I don't understand Home Depot, but whatever. You want to have that conversation with the um, with the employers and you want to be able to offer them uh, a service by coming in. If you've got local uh, restaurants or uh, local gyms or what have you, 
give them some communication, make, make your practice their preferred choice. Um, and then with the time period here, in this case, uh, each vision plan has a, has its own time frame for how much uh, leeway you get after you've informed them that you want to drop their plan. So um, before you send out any letter to them, uh, understand that time frame and get all of your ducks in a row so that once you send the letter, you know the countdown has started. Um, and when I say, you know, use this time wisely, that means, you know, while that is happening, you are doing all of this stuff. Um, one of the most important elements of this is to set up your success criteria. How do you identify whether or not what you're doing is working? So in this case, um, I've decided that uh, success criteria for dropping a vision plan would be capturing 40% of our uh, XYZ vision plan patients as open access patients in the first six months of dropping. So put a little table here to make it hopefully easier to understand. If we see a thousand patients per year, XYZ vision plan uh, patients is 10% of our patient base. The average uh, in-network uh, XYZ vision plan generates about $130 in net revenue. My average practice private pay generate uh, $330 in net revenue. So. Uh, just to kind of go over the chart here, if we had 100 in-network patients, our net revenue is 130, the total net is 13K in-network, then seeing 40 of them at an average of 330, our total net is the same or slightly higher. Now, um, you know, this is a representative sample of how some vision plans work and in terms of volume, and it is actually a conservative estimate of the patients that a practice with a great relationship with their patients can retain once they drop the vision plan. And the kickoff uh, follows logically. Um, schedule a meeting, emphasize that the team is ready because you've done the training. Uh, make it clear that this is our new mode of operation and it's up to us as a team to knock it out of the park and we're confident that you, you're you ready to do this. We've done the work, we've laid the groundwork, everyone knows what they should be doing. Um, we wanna leave questions for, uh, we wanna leave room for questions, we wanna leave room for celebrations, and then we wanna begin and end with gratitude. At least that's that's how I like to approach it. I'm, you know, with how the, overall kind of perception around employee employment is uh, right now. Um, anytime your team does successfully want to train, anytime your team does something to improve your practice, anytime you've you know worked hard with them and, and um, you're proud of the work they that they've done, let them know. You know, there's so much um, value is derived from just positive affirmations. And I um, want to make sure that we talk about that as part of this conversation as well. All right, Steve. So we do have a couple of questions. And here's a good one. Should we be more aggressive or more cautious implementing this since we are heading into a recession likely? Yeah, unfortunately, it's a very context specific um, answer is it. it really depends on your individual practice. Now, as much as I think Anagram and its software is a game-changing software for almost every practice in the space, um, it's not something that I can say is a one-size-fits-all solution for every practice at every phase of its practice's uh, life cycle. So um, if you expect a significant drop-off in your patient volume, um, you know, that's something that you want to consider it kind of a general drop off in your patient volume. That's something you want to consider as you're dropping a vision plan. Uh, but I would also recommend that you look at the overall um, impact that the vision plans have and actually that the economy is having on the vision plans. If you think about just the exam reimbursement, we know that through for most vision plans, not all vision plans, exam reimbursement has stayed uh, mostly stagnant or pretty close to stagnant for the last 20 years. So if you're receiving $40 in total for an eye exam and have been receiving $40 in total for an eye exam for the last 20 years, that $40 is now worth significantly less than it was two years ago. And it's worth significantly less than it was five years before that. 
So, you know, the question may, may not really be, you know, if we're coming to a recession, should we, we be more aggressive or more passive about it? The question um, probably ought to be, uh, how do I make my business as recession proof as I can make it? And that is a much bigger question. And I understand that it's a much bigger question, um, but that is actually what we're trying to accomplish in this four-part series is when your practice is predominantly or primarily private pay, your patients will still be your patients, irrespective of their vision plans, irrespective of your vision plans, uh, irrespective of hopefully, you know, the, the minor uh, peaks and valleys in uh, economic shifts from year to year you build a loyal fan base, a uh, loyal customer base, you build uh, processes that are repeatable, you build good, warm, fuzzy feelings and reputation in the industry, your patients will continue to find you. Awesome. And another question, how do you track captured patients from a, a vision plan that you have dropped? Because uh, they can't be singled out in some software. Do you, do you recommend maybe just a, a separate spreadsheet? Yeah, uh, especially as you're doing this kind of initially, um, because you know your time frame from when you're in network to out, and typically if your um, appointment book is well managed, you either have um, recalls set up or pre-appointments set up. So you can look at, let's say, you know, we're early August. So if I'm going to drop a plan, uh, I've got <clears throat> about 90 days uh, before then. So if I drop it today, my first month, without uh, this vision plan will be December. If I go, uh, so December one comes around, I'm no longer in network with this vision plan. It is then incumbent on me to look at the schedule for December or last December and then see, okay, last December, I saw X number of patients and Y number of those patients came from this vision plan that I'm no longer going to be in network with. It's a direct number that should be fairly easy to measure. You may not be able to mark them in your EHR going forward, but you can look at your schedule from a year ago. You look at that schedule, you see last December, I saw 30 XYZ vision plan patients. This year, I'm going to be out of network with those patients. If we take my 40% number as uh, our goal here, then success is 12 of those patients this December. Awesome. Thanks for that. We can uh, we can continue. Okay, great. I'm gonna get some more water. Thank you, everybody in the chat for your participation. I love when it's interactive; it makes it unique to this particular session. So, thank you, guys. Okay. Um, after going to market, uh, the next then question is uh, results, follow up, and iteration. So. Um, something that we ought to acknowledge is it doesn't matter how great your go-to-market plan is or how much time you spend on it or how good the training was or how good you feel about the training beforehand. Oops. Um, don't expect perfection. Um, and, and I would say don't expect perfection ever because, because it's a recipe for disappointment. But um, if, especially in this case, you... Uh, expect things to fall by the wayside, expect people to forget stuff, expect the need to repeat yourself, and expect the need to uh, take some successful staff members and pair them up with some less successful staff members to make sure that they're reinforcing this change when you can't be. So uh, keep in mind that even assuming everything, you've done everything right up until this point, the work has just gotten started. So you've set yourself up to be as successful as you can be in making this change. Um, but now you're actually doing the work of making this change and your staff is doing the work of making this change. So um, you then have to measure your results to see, okay, like, here's what I expected. Here's what success would have looked like. Where are we as it relates to success? So if we talked about, you know, the capture rate um, early on, you want to check as frequently as possible to understand uh, both how the team is feeling about the change and the practical results of the change. Uh, it's very easy. And I mentioned this earlier. It's very easy to get frustrated with the first few interactions of a new process and it's something that tends to linger in the brain. You know, rejection is hard to take kind of always. So um, 
it is then up to us to make sure that those first few no's don't linger any more than those first few no's. Um, so you want to check in frequently. Once you see that uh, the staff is feeling okay about it, that you're seeing some traction, that you're finally you know, seeing some of these out of patients on an out of network basis, uh, then you can start to check in weekly. You know, it's easy to say, okay, like we got over the hump and our staff is doing it and, and everything's great and cool, I can wash my hands, we're done. Uh, but that's certainly not the case. You wanna check in regularly. You want to check in as frequently as is necessary to build the change into a behavior. Now, certainly, we don't want to have this conversation forever. This is not something that uh, we want to linger for you know, months. We want to set this up and then uh, keep tabs on it until it's just part of the process. You know, There are things that your staff already does because it's part of your process and you don't have to talk about them anymore. You know, some of the successful opticals in this audience have you know, 80, 85, 90% AR uh, coding, right? So if 90% if of your patients are getting the AR coding, you can take that for granted, that that is going to continue to happen no matter what changes you make to your practice. And then you, maybe you should ask yourself why, right? Why is that a behavior where something else is something that needs training or babysitting or uh, repeated conversations around? And it's because um, uh, there's a, a, I think the Franklin, the Stephen Franklin or, or Covey, uh, one of those guys wrote a book and in there, there's a, what, what they call the E-bar pyramid. And it's a pyramid of, of stuff where the base is um, experiences, and then uh, above the base is beliefs, and then above beliefs is actions, and then above actions is results. So um, a person's experience are the foundation for their beliefs, which are their, a foundation for their actions, which are a foundation for their results. So AR can be good and a behavior because um, the experience that the optician has with selling it is a positive one. Their patients appreciate it. It uh, makes money for the practice. It makes their glasses better. Then their um, action, so their beliefs are that AR is a good thing. Then their actions re re reflect that. So uh, AR is good. I'm going to talk to every patient about AR. I'm going to make sure that I make it a point so that they understand that AR is good. And then the results show in the 90% of the uh, penetration around that. So if you build that E-bar pyramid around every change that you make, you've got to get the experiences first, and then the beliefs start to kick in. And the beliefs are based on that experience. So we want to keep that in mind as we're doing this. Um, we want to stay positive. We want to stay engaged. Uh, and I can't, I know I've said this a bunch of times already, but celebrate the wins. If you drop, <clears throat> if you drop XYZ vision plan and the day after your kickoff, one XYZ vision plan comes in and has an exam and has glasses and you're able to deliver that from beginning to end. You know, if you, the, the second you have a chance to stop as a team and say, holy shit, guys, we did it. Right. Do it. Stop recognize that it happened, recognize that we have achieved one element of success, and then build from there. Um, then as you keep doing this, uh, identify the changes that have to be made to your process and don't hesitate to implement them. Listen to the feedback that your staff is getting. A lot of uh, what goes into a go-to-market plan can be right and, and can instinctively be the right move. But not all of it is, and none of it is certainly guaranteed to be. So listen to what your staff says. And, and if they tell you something that, you know, there was a, we misunderstood the logic of a process or put something in the wrong place, listen to the feedback, you know, change what you're doing and don't delay. Um, you don't want negative experiences early on because, again, that's sort of foundational to the rest of what happens. And then the last bullet point here, I think, is the one that, this audience would would like the least, um, but be ready to hold your team accountable. And I did uh, touch on this in the first session as well. Um, accountability is super important to implementing any kind of change. And uh, part of the difficulty with accountability now is you may not be able to coach somebody without fear of them quitting. And if they quit, you're you're right running on such a tight staffing, um, output that if they quit, the rest of your team is put behind the eight ball and it's not a good situation to be in. So um, 
as you're thinking about accountability, also think about recruitment, also think about having a team uh, that can supplement if we lose an employee. And that's not just for making changes, that should be a general concept and not to plug ODs on finance too hard. But if you could constantly be recruiting at 19 bucks a month, that is uh, such a tremendous value that it can mean so much for your practice. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, and last up is the most important step, which are next steps. So uh, our next step is going to be a session on September 11th. Uh, you can click the link there for those of you that are sharing the screen. You can click the link there to register. I'm sure ODs on finance will be sending stuff out as well. Um, and kind of homework, uh, write a first draft of a go-to-market plan for one change that you want to implement in your practice. Um, and a second follow-up here, uh, share it with a trusted colleague or friend and ask for feedback. And then last up, um, get ready to deploy and get ready for session three, where we discuss what happens next. And this part, so we, session three will be all about, we identified where we were, we identify where we want to go, where we want to be headed, and we built a go-to-market plan or an action plan or steps to make that single change. Uh, session three will be a lot more about um, making sure the last decision we made was the right one. And not just you know looking at it and telling ourselves it was the right decision, but taking the steps we need to take uh, to have made it the right decision. And that's going to be a lot more about staff training, a lot more about um, development, a lot more uh, about building concepts on top of each other. So um, we're going to look to teach you how to overcome inertia and self-imposed obstacles. I know I talk a lot about physics in these presentations. I just think it's an easy concept to grab onto. So that's what we're going to talk about next time. Um, here is my contact information. So if you guys have questions for me about the presentation, about anagram, about you know what I whatever you have, uh, whatever you have questions about, I'm open to helping. Uh, as mentioned, I love the industry. I love helping people in the industry. So if there's anything um, that you guys need or want. And I appreciate, I saw kind of a, a bunch of chats come through about some ideas for resources. I can't guarantee what I'll be able to build before the next session, but uh, it'll be useful to have a list and, and something that I, I will definitely um, put on my roadmap. Awesome. <clears throat> Steve, I uh, really appreciate your uh, thoughts on accountability too. I, I read a quote that accountability makes good uh, organizations great and greater organizations unstoppable. So I think that's absolutely right there. A couple more questions uh, here are uh, what kind of discounts do you think are appropriate for those who drop vision plans? Again, very context specific. Um, but if, if we're talking about services, um, you want to keep it reasonable. Your services are priced the way they are for a reason. Um, so rather than emphasizing the discounted element of the services, emphasize the quality element of the services. Um, so, you know, a, a typical vision plan patient will get an eye exam that includes a standard eye exam, a refraction, maybe a dilation, um, and that's kind of it, and you know all the standard stuff that comes with it. Many practices that I've spoken with have additional diagnostic testing that they believe are necessary for a patient and their doctor to understand the quality and health of their vision and the ocular system and, and system in general. So if your eye exam is $200 and it is that way because of the time that you spend with the patient and the equipment and testing that you do, make sure that your entire team is able to have that conversation and they understand why it costs what it costs. And that's not to say you shouldn't give any discount. Give them, give a patient whatever discount you think is necessary, especially if it's like a first time deal. So if uh, XYZ vision plan patient is used to your practice and um, you, know, you wanna keep them as a patient, give them a strong discount on that side to show them actually the difference between the exam that you wanted to give them and the exam that you had to be giving them because of the vision plan. It would make a very clear delineation from A to B. Um, so I think that's uh, that's 
massive. Uh, then on the material side, um, certainly you can think about discounts, but I would also urge everybody to think about a different product mix for your private pay patients. Um, you know, Essler, Shamir, Hoya, Zeiss, they all make terrific lenses. They make great coatings. Uh, they make really fantastic progressives, but there's no denying that they're expensive, right? There's no denying that they're expensive to manufacture. They take time to manufacture uh, and they increase sort of the perception that your eyeglasses are expensive at private practice. Um, there are progressive lens manufacturers like IOT, like Horizon, a bunch of other ones that also exist that you can purchase progressives and coatings and actually complete sets of eyewear uh, with frames included for a fraction of what you're paying. So if you uh, are thinking about pricing, it's the right thing to be thinking about, but don't keep yourself locked in to, you know, the brand name progressives or, uh, or, you know, brand name AR coatings, especially because uh, independent labs and manufacturers want to prove themselves to you. They want to prove that their designs are just as good. They want to prove that their coatings are just as good. So if you're looking at a, a talking to a lab and they have a house progressive that they say is just as good, ask them for a free sample. Where, you know, find a progressive patient among your staff, or um, you know, some of uh, I have a partnership with Nikon. Nikon with their progressives, although they are still premium pricing, uh, they tell practices to find their most finicky progressive wearer and fit them with that. If that finicky progressive wearer likes it, then you're, everyone else is gravy, right? So um, think about not just discounts, but also your product mix. Um, in every facet. I hope that answers the question. Awesome. Yeah, it does. I'm going to uh, share my screen here, Steve, so that people can register for uh, installment three as we continue talking. Another question is to, uh, so I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on, on concierge optometry, which I think is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. I, I, uh, the idea being patients paying a monthly or annual subscription fee. I think it's great. Um, there, more of that is being built out in healthcare as well. And it is something that um, patients and customers are broadly familiar with. Everyone has a subscription, a monthly subscription or two that they're paying for, it, whether it's, you know, Netflix or Birchbox or uh, whatever, Loot Crate, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that people get on a monthly basis, and it is a great way for them to know they participate in a thing. It's easy, it's repeated, and it's often taken for granted. Uh, as an example, I've been a Netflix subscriber for, I don't know, like seven years or something, and they increase their pricing periodically. And to be honest, I don't watch anything on Netflix. It's just not like, there's not much on Netflix that is, that appeals to me anymore. And, but I've kept, I kept my subscription there for a lot longer than I probably should have. And, um, and it was fine. I was happy to, to keep supporting it because I like their business model. And I think there's a lot to be said, uh, for that with your, um, with your practice, uh, an element that brick and mortar businesses don't really think about is a uh, term, in, that we talk about in tech a lot is MRR, which is monthly recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. And if you have like as a private practice uh, business running with patients, you don't have an MRR because everything depends on who comes in and what they buy. And it's very difficult to project. If you have a, um, a concierge practice where there's a fixed dollar amount per month to participate and you have, let's say 500 customers that exist in there, you can you have an MRR from which you can base like a, a baseline expectation of revenue. Everything that comes up uh, from that will still be extremely variable, a variable, but you have a baseline expectation and that makes it easier for staffing, that makes it easier to invest, that makes it easier to do more marketing stuff because you have an understanding that this amount is more or less guaranteed for me and um, that's a good place to begin having customers that uh, agree to see you uh, is also a fantastic idea because um, it is a 
uh, sort of like the Groupon model. Your customers have already given you some money and they want their, they will come back to make sure they get value out of it. And that is a positive for everybody. Yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> well, Steve, uh, thanks a lot for all the information that you shared. Wanted to thank our sponsors again, Vision Source and Optify. And uh, just wanted to tell you that on behalf of me and the entire ODS on finance team and everyone who registered, <clears throat> that what you're doing is important. You're helping practice owners uh, increase independence, practice growth, and enhance patient experience. And you and your information has tremendous value. So I just wanted to tell you, tell you that you're such a wealth of knowledge and, and a great resource for all of our colleagues. Uh, so thank you. And I know everyone is just hanging on the edge of their seat for, for installment three. Thank you again to our sponsors. And next is raffle time. Julie, would you like to announce the raffle winner? Yeah, the raffle winner. So everybody that commented um, that you'll be here, um, um, Ashley is in a little tiny pool of those I will select. And the one that is going to win the $100 raffle is Lynette Klein. So thank you so much, Lynette, for commenting and being here. Um, send us an email at, ODs on, at admin at odsonfinance.com and we'll send over that $100 raffle prize. Thank you. Awesome. Big thanks to Steve Alexander. Big thanks to Vision Source and Optify. I'll leave this slide up so you can scan the QR code and sign up for session three. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you.